no mai haere mai, no na mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Um, ko Shona Harvey Toko Ingoa. I work at Napatata Korero Auckland Libraries um, in Te Wahi Rangaho ki Te Puku Research Central as the Family History Specialist. I'm part of the Learning and Engagement Team um, for Auckland Libraries. Um, so um, you're here today to see the um, see me talk about uh, beginning your family history. Um, just to give you a brief, brief background about how we're set up, um, we have four research centres that are hubs in different areas. Uh, we have one out south um, above Manukau Library. We have one um, out west, which is above Waitakere Library. And we have one out north, which is above um, Takapuna Library. Um, and of course, they're each named with um, their designated points on the compass, north, south and west. Um, and we are central. Um, and as you know, we're on the second floor of um, Central City Library. Um, the collections at each of the four places um, are kind of a bit similar, but a bit different. Um, they have their own specialist collections according to the area that they're in for local history. Um, they, they each have um, family history collections um, for New Zealand um, and Whakapapa. Um, here at Central, we have an international family history collection. Um, and while our staff across all the research centres um, are, are trained to um, do um, all, all manner of research, um, including family history, um, here you get the extra, extra help and attention because we do have an international collection here that we're used to using. Um, one, of the, one of the things that um, uh, we do as part of the um, research centres as we organise the heritage talks of which this is one. So um, if you if you want to grab one of these leaflets and you haven't got one as yet, um, feel free to, to grab it. It covers all the events that we're doing to date up until the end of November. Get right started on why we're here. Um, the first question is why might you want to research your family history? People have all sorts of reasons why they might want to want to start. Um, but one of the good things is, is that um, one of the big things is, is it's for our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren, possibly. Um, they, there was a um, there was a, a huge um, study done by Emory University after 9-11 happened um, to see how the impact on um, people knowing their family history had. On, on people's well-being after 9-11. And they discovered that the, the children and indeed adults that had, um, had uh, knew about their family history were a lot more secure in themselves and a lot more confident that their families would be able to get through hard times. Um, and uh, they, were, they were less psychologically damaged, if you like, um, by the events of 9-11 because they knew about their family history and they knew that their family had withstood hard times before and had tragedies before and had come through it okay, unscathed. So um, the, the, the ones that didn't have um, any knowledge of their family history didn't do as, as well, nearly as well. Um, and the other big reason, of course, is if, if you don't preserve your family history, it's gone within three, three generations um, and then you have to start again from scratch like some of us have to do. Um, so the other reason researching your family history, and this speaks to um, children in particular, um, because family history is a strong component in the, uh, in the school curriculum and probably will play a bigger part in the school curriculum in the future. Um, it, it teaches children um, basic literacy, the, the reading, the writing, and the maths. The maths come in when you're trying to calculate how old somebody is and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, it, it teaches them how to look for resources and how to use them, um, how to use the internet and the database, um, critical thinking, weighing up one lot of evidence against another, weighing up the um, uh, different bits of information and different sources, you know, what's a reliable source, what isn't. Um, what's a primary source, what's a secondary source, um, how to research and keep track of information, keeping research logs and, and things like that so that they know 
where they found the information and how to find it again. Um, a teacher's world and local history, you'll find that most people who've been researching family history for a long time um, have a really good handle on, on general history um, because when they've been researching their families, um, they've been finding out about the background on the period when they, when they were um, living. Um, it also teaches um, local history, um, local to the area that your ancestors were living in, um, geography, um, you know, and countries and borders and what countries used to be called, etc. And languages, because often our uh, often our documents aren't necessarily in our first language. Um, quite often, the older ones can be in Italian. Uh, sorry, Latin, even. Um, or you know, you might have ancestors in France or whatever. Um, and you learn how to cite your sources and, and why you cite them, which is really good grounding for um, children once they get up to senior school in particular. So that's the whys. Um, so um, genealogy and family history are two different terms. Um, genealogy is a study of pedigree. Um, so that's the collecting of the names and the birth dates, marriages and, and deaths, etc. Um, getting gathering the, the ba basic facts and creating relationships with them, um, knowing who's married to who and who whose children who belong to which couple, etc. Family history is about the stories. Um, so it's about the social history that the family um, and your ancestors um, had in their lives, you know, uh, covers their schooling, their occupations, their um, military um, wars, any wars that they lived through, um, a multitude of things, what, what they did in their lives. So it, it fleshes out the names and the dates that you've originally had. Um, and I, um, I think that most of us start off as genealogists and then when we sort of get the bug a bit, we're, um, we expand out to become family historians. Just read this little cartoon out here in case you can't see it. I've been researching my genealogy online and it seems I have a relative who was an Asian American explorer. He spent his whole life cutting mountain trails from the Mississippi to the West to open fur trading um, routes. That's all I could find, except that he died in 2003. I mean, not, not a likely story. So, you know, it's or you listen to these stories um, and you, you gather the um, information and then you seek to find out whether it's verified, whether it's verifiable. Um, so there we've got um, another cartoon here of two women chatting over the fence and uh, one saying, that's about it. I've already told you twice as much as what she told me. So, you know, looking out for the exaggerations. Uh, one of the things that you might um, remember is that uh, um, some, sometimes stories aren't true, but maybe there's a grain of truth, or sometimes the story is amalgamation of several people and they've pieced all the stories together um, and said, you know, that it's about one person rather than little bits of information about other people. Um, so a good place to start, of course, is at your local library um, and uh, or bookstores um, and, and buying how-to guides. There's plenty of how-to guides out there that you can buy. Um, there's a general or, or borrow. Um, there's a general how to do your genealogy or your family history. And then it's broken down into countries. You know, they've also got how to research in Scotland and how to research in Wales, etc. Um, and that's because the record collections that you have in each country are similar, but they're different and they're accessed in different ways and there's different laws and there's different customs and things that you have to think about. Um, so I would recommend having a good read of any of those books. Of course, for New Zealand, um, these books are kind of our Bible, um, written by the late great Anne Brumell. Um, and um, she's, she was a, an immense treasure and a powerhouse in New Zealand genealogy. And nobody to this date, and it's a challenge for you guys out there if you're interested, has written an update to any of her books um, that, you know, some of the information's a little bit out of date maybe because they were written quite a while ago. Um, but, you know, the, the, the same record collections, the same principles are the same basically for, for New Zealand. And I would recommend um, referring to her books as um, 
um, the Bible for New Zealand research. Of course, the other place that you can get um, information is from libraries um, like us. Um, we have very good research guides on our website, um, and that includes how to research in New Zealand, as well as um, other places uh, above. Um, the, uh, the first, the first um, arrow down um, points out um, a family history research guide that you can actually download. Um, as well as read online. And there's a Whakapapa research guide too, a local history, etc. And then there's a link there to our online resources that you can, that you can get. Um, then the second arrow down is an Ask an Expert. Um, we provide research services. Um, and uh, some, if you're an Auckland Libraries member, we provide the first 30 minutes for free um, for any, any research that we do. And then it is $25 per half hour thereafter. Um, if you're not an Auckland Libraries member, um, you will get charged for the first half hour as well. Um, but, you know, that's basically getting one of us to research and you need to have kind of a refined question that you want to ask. Not just can you research my family history, please, but um, can you find out who my great grandfather was and where he, where he lived or, or something like that. You know, have a refined question. Um, uh, unless you've got a lot of money, <laughs> um, how you know it could take a long time to research your family history. Some of us have been doing it for 30 or 40 years and still haven't finished. Um, the other thing that we offer is document supply too. So if you can't get into the library and you want somebody to print out a birth notice or um, look up something on one of the databases quickly and print it out for you, we do that to you as well. And providing it takes less than 30 minutes and you're a member of Auckland Library, um, that's, that's free. Um, so these are other places that you can look at for getting started. Um, uh, family search, that's kind of my go-to, my main go-to myself, because, um, you know, you get people from all over the world coming into the library, and I might not have the knowledge um, working in that particular country um, that the person's asking about. So I automatically go to the family search wiki, and I would search whatever country or even whatever, whatever state they're talking about, because sometimes the information is different from one state to another if you're talking about places like the US and and what have you. So I go there and I have a look up to see what re resources are available, what's available online, um, some history of the country. Um, it'll tell you about border changes and different years and stuff like that. Um, sort of as well as family search, I would also um, you maybe use Cindy's List. Um, Cindy's List is a genealogist just like us, um, family historian who created basically what is a directory of links on her website um, that can take you to all manner of um, family history resources. Um, and and she, she includes some quite um, obscure links on there too. Um, and it's all organized um, in very nice librarian format for, for us, um, either under country or under subject heading. Um, so you can, you can find stuff um, very good links in, in her website too. And of course, there is another one over there called Janoki, um, which is basically um, Genealogy UK and Ireland. Um, and so that covers the country, countries that I, I've um, mentioned, the countries in UK and Ireland. And it's a similar sort of scenario to Cindy's list. It provides you with links and information that are um, unique to UK, UK and Ireland. So those are good places. So lots of reading before you get started, because um, you you know you need to know um, what you what you don't know already maybe, and where to start looking. So in a, in general terms, um, we always say um, it's a typical catch cry that you'll find genealogists, um, experienced genealogists, will say you always start with what you know. So you sit there and you plop down as much as what you know about your family as possible, names, dates, um, et cetera, going back as far as you can. Um, then you would talk to your relatives, um, especially the older ones, because the older ones are going to have more information um, than, than the younger ones, perhaps. Um, so start with the older ones. Um, I, I kind of um, always recommend that if you're interviewing your relatives that you uh, 
turn it into an oral history um, because that's a really valuable um, resource for later as well. So you're recording your, your relative, maybe your, your mother or your grandmother or, or whatever, or your auntie, and getting her voice down um, on, on recording, um, finding out as much about the facts as you can, but also about the social, social um, history of the family too. Um, and just think what a wonderful resource that is, just that recording for, for future generations to be able to hear that person's voice. Um, that they, you know, would not have heard if you hadn't recorded it. So that's killing two birds with one stone, if you like, you know, doing a um, oral history at the same time as working on your family history. Um, so you need to know the differences between the different sorts of um, record collections that you might be looking at. So we talk about civil registration, or in the States, they talk about vital records. These are the ones that are... Um, uh, are kept by the government. Um, so when you when a baby is born, you register that baby's birth with the government, um, and that's what they call a civil registration. The same with marriages and deaths, you register them with the government. Um, in different countries around the world, this process of civil of registering with the government started in different time periods. So you need to find out what time period it started in, in your country of research, um, because if um, it's earlier than that, then you'll be looking at um, parish or church records because the church took care of those functions before it became a government function, a state function. Um, so the churches would look after um, baptisms, marriages and, and funerals or burials. Um, so you would be looking at those records. Um, it's a good idea, even if you do have civil registration documents or, or information to follow up on, um, that you also look at the church records too, because quite often they give you different information or more information than you had. Um, so it's always a good idea to have a look at those. Um, then there's the sundry official records, which um, are things like your wills and probates and your school records and passports and driver's licenses. So your, your family might have a collection of those in an envelope somewhere. Um, and uh, it's always a good idea to look through, through um, to see what people have got. School reports, you know, um, attendance reports, things like that. Very useful for, for furthering information. Um, other family collections, photographs fantastic. Photographs are fantastic. Um, it's really useful if you know who the people are in the photographs. Um, how many people here in the room have got photographs and they have no idea who the people are in the photographs? Yeah, I think we've all nearly all put our hand up here. I'm sure you have online as well. Um, so, um, so sometimes you have to do a bit of detective work to see if you can find out who the people are in the photographs and you know you might need to use extra skills like um working out um when what the clothing dating the clothing in the background and and having to a look in the photograph for other clues of course letters letters are fantastic i know last year when we were cleaning out my mum's stuff um she had huge box fulls of letters um going back from before she even married my father um, and my mum my mom was great at keeping things like that. So um, that's very useful because that gives, you know, further insight into the family um, because quite often they don't just talk about what's happening to them when they're writing the letter, but they quite often refer back to distant, distant memories to, or, or to people who are no longer alive and that can add to it for you. Um, and postcards, you know, um, I think postcards really became valuable, um, sorry, popular at the beginning of the 1900s, people would start traveling around and sending postcards to each other. Um, so yeah, and, and often all these documents don't just mention the people that your person that you're currently researching, but they mention other, pe other people in the family too, and even family friends, and that can be useful as well. So um, that's what you need to do, talk to your relatives. So interview your relatives. Um, family members, um, but go through and verify the names and dates that they give you. Don't presume that they're correct because quite often they're not. Um, look, look for their births, deaths and marriages or their baptism and or birth, de baptisms, burials and parish marriages. Um, order the certificates for at least the direct line of your ancestors. Um, that's really important. Don't just rely on indexes. 
um, because quite often there were people in the same area with the same name who were born around about the same time and it would be wrong to assume that that's your person. Um, I have had people in here who have been researching their, um, uh, their family um, for a, a few years and uh, they hadn't been getting gathering this documentation and looking at their information a bit closer, you discover that they've actually gone off onto the wrong family because they, they didn't bother to get that one certificate and they just assumed that that was correct and off they went. So all that, all that work that they've done, you know, wasted as far as they're concerned. Um, it does cost you some money, but you know, you, you can, there are little tips and tricks that you can do to kind of narrow down it being less likely that you order the wrong one. Um, and we might, we'll talk about that later. Um, so in, in the in first instance, add the information that you've got onto a, um, a pedigree chart or a family group sheet, or if you're really confident into a database, um, there's nothing wrong with starting a database. Um, there are plenty of um, uh, family, history, soft, family history databases out there that you can use. Um, and, uh, you know, you can often get one that's just a trial um, or a demo version. And if you like it, then you invest the money in it. Um, so um, there's uh, an example of what a pedigree chart is. So that just follows the direct line back. There's no room there for siblings. Um, it just follows the direct line back. Um, and uh, for your amusement, Donald Duck's family tree. So, um, and um, old Einstein, um, why he gave up doing, whoops, why he gave up doing his family history. <laughs> um, he preferred general relativity rather than family history. Um, so this is um, what we call a family history notebook. It has um, uh, family group sheets inside. So at the top of the top of the sheet, you have the family name, and then you have the individual's name, what they were born, where, their parents, where they were baptized, etc., their spouse, their spouse's parents, if they got divorced and remarried, etc. So it just gives you a very, very simple um, potted um, potted notes, if you like, of the information that you need. And it's very handy if you prefer working analog or working with paper paper um, to be able to take when you're going on a research trip somewhere. Um, and then when you get um, various documents, you can note, note down that you've actually got them and um, um, what the references are for them on there. So um, you can get family history notebooks books from a number of different places, but we provide them in the library for people who want to buy them for $8.30. So um, um, probably one of the, the cheapest options. Of course, some people nowadays like to input their family history straight into a um, family history database, and then they can take their laptops or their tablets with them instead. Um, so it just depends on what way you prefer to work. Um, so the other thing you need to talk to your family about is actually asking them, not just getting their um, anecdotal um, or their oral history, asking them if they've got any documents themselves. So not only looking for your own documents that you might have lying around the house, but asking your relatives, can I have copies of your documents, please? Um, and uh, so, so, that's, so that's what you would grab. Um, just a note here, short certificates aren't useful. They, some countries issue short certificates and you have to order a, a full certificate separately. Um, and uh, the full certificate is the one that's got the most information on it. Um, short certificates are not very useful at all because they don't have very much information on them. Um, <clears throat> and um, before I go on, in New Zealand's case, we don't order, for family history purposes, we don't order a certificate at all we ask for a printout, an electronic printout, because that is a copy of the original register. Um, on certificates, they only provide um, certificate information on there that's required um, to legally prove that that person is who they say they are um, under that particular day's law. Um, but um, the, um, the, through time, as, as, as people um, and governments have changed, they've changed the requirements of what has been needed to collect on the register. So um, sometimes, um, quite often, you'll find that the register has more information than a certificate, which is then 
um, which is then tra um, transcripted by, by a clerk onto an official document. Uh, so the other thing too is learning about the commencement of civil registration as I uh, re uh, respond, uh, referred to earlier. Um, so that's quite important because you need to know where you're looking for the information. Um, in the case of Australia, um, you can see, um, I think the latest civil registration was 1930 when it started and the earliest looks was 1838. Um, so, you know, depending on what state. Um, and state records in, um, in Australia um, have typically been held on a state by state basis, but they're now more widely becoming more available across Australia. If you use family, um, find my past, for example, you don't have to worry about what state um, necessarily. Um, you'll see that it says New Zealand um, civil registration started in 1848. But there were some late registrations a bit later, which takes some, you might be able to find some back as early as um, um, 1840. Um, but England and Wales, 1837, Ireland, 1864. Um, but they started um, collecting um, non Roman Catholic marriages as early as 1848, uh, 1845, um, and Scotland, um, 1855. Um, so, so that's, that's um, and every other country in the world has their own particular dates for when civil registration started. Some of them quite early, some of them quite late. Um, so this is our birth, deaths and marriages for New Zealand. Um, we have them on microfiche um, going right up to 1990, um, from 1840 to 1990. Um, and they're very well used still, even though you can find um, often find the information online. Um, people prefer to have a look at the fiche um, in, in certain circumstances. Um, you can see that the NZSG have got the New Zealand Marriages um, CD. We, we've got that in our drawer as well. Um, so that's another um, re resource for marriages. Um, and there is a, I'll talk about websites in a minute. Um, and there is another there is a set of books across the top called the district keys, and I'll explain the district keys in a minute. This is um, a microfiche for those of you who have not seen microfiche before. I think everybody in the room would have. Um, and these, those black blobs are pages. So each page is um, an, an image that gets blown up when you put it on the uh, scanner. Um, and it has um, an index of the births, deaths or the marriage. Um, the district keys um, was a clever device that um, uh, <coughs> the NZSG put together. That's the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. <coughs> and what it, what it is, is you can look up um, the microfiche and it gives you um, a registration number on the microfiche. Then if you look in the district keys on that particular year in the district keys, and you try and find where that number might be sitting in the district keys, um, because it might have Auckland um, might be numbered, Auckland in the first quarter might be numbered zero to 300. So if you've got, if your registration number says 254, you know that that birth happened in Auckland um, in the first quarter. So that, that's an immense help um, because it doesn't tell you very much on the microfiche about where that person, it just gives you a name um, and um, a year and, and the registration number, basically. Um, uh, you get a little bit more, tiny bit more in, in later years, but not very much more. Um, the other thing we have, of course, is the um, births, deaths and marriages, the index have been indexed online as well. Um, this is the Department of Internal Affairs website, um, and this is called the Historic Births, Deaths and Marriages. And why it's called historic is because it's um, only people who were born more than 100 years ago or married more than 80 years ago or died more than 50 years ago, unless they're over 80, will be in this database. And the reason for that is the um, um, privacy issues. Uh, we had a bit of a scandal a few years, quite a few years back where an XMP 
had used a birth certificate of a, a dead child um, to order a passport. Um, and that was just one example of fraud. Um, so they, they tighten things up. Um, and uh, so that's why, um, whoops, wrong way. We have this wonderful CD here, um, or not CD, database on one of our local computers that goes from 1991 to 1997. That's very popular because I think we're the only place in the country that's got it. Um, because in 1997, the new law came out where they tightened up for privacy reasons and they weren't allowed to sell that um, index anymore. Um, so they took it off the market. But we'd already bought it, cost an arm and a leg, but we bought it. So we've, we've got it and it's very, very helpful. Um, but of course, we have, can't help you after 1998 in that way. Um, oh, wrong way, this way. So, so um, yeah, so that when they input all the microfiche, all the, all the old records into the historic BDMs, um, they gave them new record IDs. So the reference numbers on the historic births, deaths and marriages don't in any way relate to the reference numbers on the microfiche. And that's part of the reason why we've kept the microfiche because the district keys are so handy for being able to tell us where and in what quarter um, the birth or the death or the marriage happened. Whereas you don't get the same type of information off the database. Um, so, um, um, so that's part of the reason why we've held on to it. The other reason why we hold on to the microfiche is because if an adoption has happened, you'll get two listings for that birth. So you've got the listing for the um, under the original name and listing under the adoption. And um, you can sometimes, um, quite often, you can cross-reference and you can find out the original, find out the original birth um, by looking at the microfiche. Um, so that's another reason why we keep hold of them. Um, so you, you, do, you do your search and you choose whether you want to search um, under um, births or marriages or deaths, etc. Um, and the top result is what you would get. So there you can see from the Department of Internal Affairs website, um, 1898. So that's the year that the registration happened, not necessarily the year that the child was born. Um, because they may have been born in December or even November um, of 1897, but only registered in 1898. Um, and then the rest of the number is the registration number. And it tells you there that the family name is um, Keel and what the child's name is and the parents' given names. Um, and that's quite, that's the usefulness of the historic births, deaths and marriages. Um, then um, on the microfiche, um, that's the sort of information you can glean from the microfiche, that bottom one, um, because that is a copy of the microfiche. Um, Ancestry bought a copy of the microfiche and then indexed it into their database. And they used the district keys um, to determine where the birthplace was and that. When they first did it, they weren't very good at it. So we had a lot of Auckland people being born in the Chatham Islands, <laughs> but they've, they've gone through and they've fixed most of them now. So um, I kind of always recommend that people use the two together. So um, you, you, use, uh, you use both resources together, Ancestry and um, Historic BDMs. Um, and if you get stuck, refer back to the microfiche. I'm a digital person, so I prefer to use the websites first. Um, uh, for me, it's quicker. But um, if I have any doubts or anything, I want to double check, I revert back to the fiche. Some people like doing it the other way around, and that's fine. Um, then we get to the non-historic records. Non-historic records are a bit harder to get hold of. You kind of have to know what you're looking for already. Um, and you kind of have to have a, have a reason for looking for it. Um, so you have to have a, um, a verified real me account, um, which I'm sure everyone's had. Um, the unpleasant um, experience with it's not it's not that um, help um, easy so um, and that's to prevent fraud so that you're not ordering somebody else's birth certificate so you can pretend to be them basically and so that they've got a record of who's ordering what as well 
Um, so um, you use them for ordering non-historic non records. Um, so this is the sort of information you get on a um, New Zealand um, New Zealand birth. Um, you can see here, um, before 1875, they didn't include the date and place of the parents' marriage or the age of the parents at birth of the child. But um, <clears throat> all this was included afterwards. So we had um, we had the parents' details. Um, and just about everything else that you would need to do a good um, jump backwards in, in generation. Um, so this is, um, this is a certified copy of the, of the entry um, of a full certificate. So that's the sort of information you would also get if you were ordering, um, in this instance, if you were ordering an electronic version. So this is a printout of an early birth entry, 1883. Um, and you can see here, it's got where they were born. Um, and um, it notes there that the child wasn't present at, at the time of um, registration. Gives you all the information you need to know uh, about the parents um, and uh, um, who, who actually reported the birth and stuff. Um, so this is um, a, um, uh, a marriage, a record of a marriage. And you can see there that um, quite sparse information there. Um, so this guy was in the Colonial Defence Force. That tells you a, bit, a little bit about him. Um, when it says full age, that means that they're over 21. So they didn't have to ask their parents permission to get married. Um, there's another marriage that's after 1881. Um, you can see there's a lot more information here. Um, just want to make a note that these um, New Zealand certificates are from uh, Marie Hickey's collection. Um, I don't have any New Zealand research myself, apart from what I do from, for customers. Um, just, um, just pointing that one out. Um, so, you know, you get quite, more, quite a bit more information after 1881. Um, death certificates. So before 1875, they didn't include things like the duration of the last illness, which might matter to you, um, or the medical attendant and when they last saw the deceased, any of the parents' details and where buried and all the rest of it. None of that was included um, at all. Um, but 1912 onwards, they added all the new information um, and included the usual place of residence. And if they had Māori blood, they said what, um, what tribes, what iwi the, the mother and the father came from, which is very useful as well. Um, so um, Māori births weren't registered until 1913. Um, you might be lucky. Uh, you might find a Māori birth on the general uh, registration, um, more particularly if they had mixed blood, um, like a uh, Pākehā father, for example, um, but until 1913, they, they didn't bother registering any, any births, Māori births, um, and they were indexed separately until 1960, um, and then after that, they were absorbed into the general um, registration. Um, Māori deaths, same thing, um, and uh, 1913 onwards, um, and again, only registered pre-1913, usually if the father is European. Um, and in addition to what's found on European death certificates, you get all the, all the information about the, um, the hapu of the mother and the father um, and uh, degree of relationship to the deceased um, of the um, informant as well. Um, and again, they were separate, separately indexed until 1960. Um, we've got um, uh, loads of information you can get from cemeteries. Cemeteries and um, funeral book order books are really um, useful. Um, I'm sure um, those of you who don't don't know, there's um, two websites that are um, um, Find a Grave and Billion Graves are used as crowdsourcing um, uh, websites. Uh, you can go along and you can take photographs of headstones. Um, and upload them to either find a grave or billion graves and transcribe the headstones. Um, and that's immensely useful for, um, for researchers like us. You know, we can find them online there. 
Um, so that's always a re um, resource not to be forgotten. But as well as that, you've got um, cemeteries that are looked after by uh, local body authorities, particularly in New Zealand. Um, every council um, has cemeteries under its wing that they are charged with taking care of. Most of them have got their cemeteries now indexed and online. Um, very few haven't. Um, and for those councils who don't have cemeteries online yet, um, if you email them, they might be kind enough to do a look up for you in their paper records or their local database. Um, churches, um, parishes are less likely to have a database online. Um, they have, have their data, if they've got a database, it's a local database, um, or they might have paper records still, and you would need to um, ask them um, to, to provide information for you. Um, the other good source uh, relating to uh, cemeteries is funeral directors. They're, they're really helpful. If you, can, um, um, if you can work out who the funeral director might have been, and you might do that by um, finding a death notice, for example, in the newspaper, um, or you might just want to take a, a pot, pot luck um, and, and write to the funeral director and ask them if they've got any information on a certain person, you might be able to get that information from them. Um, the other thing too is often funeral directors um, leave their archives to local organisations. For example, we have C. Little and Sons, we have their archive here in special collections, and that's been um, indexed onto Kura. And uh, the images from the funeral order book have been also digitized and have been linked to, to Kura as well. So um, they're, they're on our, our website and you can search them under Kura, which is K-U-R-A. <laughs> um, but we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit further on. Um, and um, I know the New Zealand Society of Genealogists have also got a, a couple of funeral directors. They've got their archives too. Auckland Museum has. Um, so basically um, think about where your people came from, where they might have been buried themselves, and then start asking around in the local institutions and family history societies to see what information they might be able to help you with. Um, some of them also collect school records, military records, etc. So just keep that in mind too. So one of the things that you need to do is um, you need to be very careful with your strategies. Um, you need to look at, look at your documents that you're collecting and the anecdotal information that you're collecting. And you need to look at the facts, the facts or the statements in every document and figure out you know, who wrote it, why did they write it, when was it written um, and where, and how was it written? Was it translated or transcribed? Um, and what was the source of the information? The source of the information is important. Um, you, who, when you get a birth certificate of somebody, um, it's the person's legal name. Whatever's on that birth certificate is their legal name, even if it is incorrect. We get cases where people have, um, who people's name has been registered incorrectly, and they didn't bother to correct that name. Um, and so they left it standing on that birth certificate. Now that is that person's legal name. Whatever they call themselves now, um, even if it's a different spelling or the names are the other way around or whatever, um, that document is their legal name. So that's what you need to bear in mind. Um, if people, people change, find the mistake and they go back to change it and correct it, that's fine. That document then supersedes the original document. <clears throat> So um, you need to check for um, name variations. So you might get different spellings of names. Um, uh, customers sometimes say um, they spelt the name wrong in 1850. Well, no, that was the original, that was the spelling of the name in 1850. Um, as far as the person who was living in 1850 is concerned, they might say that you're spelling it wrong now. Um, so you need to bear that in mind. And also, um, Literacy levels weren't quite as high as they are now as they were in 1850. Um, changes in use of first and middle name. Um, how many people don't like their first name and use their middle name instead? Quite a lot of people. Um, cultural naming patterns. Um, the, um, the Scots um, and the Irish were very good and the Scandinavians are very good with their cultural naming patterns. Um, and uh, sometimes you can, uh, you can trace 
trace who's who by looking at the naming patterns. You know, um, the first first daughter might be named after the second or the, the grandmother, maternal grandmother or whatever, you know, um, things like that. Um, and in my in my my family on my Scots side, for example, my mother actually has Duncan had a Duncan as a middle name, and that was after her um, paternal grandmother's maiden name. Um, so that's what my family did, and and th through the Scots was they had that naming. Um, and sort of talking about that too, um, when we're talking about illegitimacy you might find that somebody has a surname um, as a middle name and it's obviously a surname um, and you don't know who the father is. Well, the, the middle name quite often gives you a huge clue as to who the father might be because quite often the, the mothers gave the child um, the father's surname as a middle name. So that's where you start hunting. Um, nicknames, um, so many people are called Dick instead of Richard, Bob instead of Robert, all the usual things. Um, in official documents, they should be set, spelt, they should be named by their proper names, but sometimes they, they're not. Sometimes they're, um, um, they've got their uh, uh, nicknames. Name changes, either in formal or by deed poll, multiple marriages. Don't assume that a woman has only ever been married once or even twice. Um, Keep looking for marriages up until she know, you know she died. When, she, when you know she died, you don't look for any more marriages. <laughs> we don't want any marriages 100 years after she died, as we've seen on some family trees. Events in, that can cause a name change, often um, immigration or emigration. Um, uh, quite often, there is that old fallacy of uh, the clerk changing somebody's name at um, Ellis Island and New York when people were coming in. Um, more often than not, it's the person themselves changing their name, um, either because they wanted to fit in better with the local community. Um, and um, so they chose an anglicized version of their name, um, particularly true of the Scandinavians and also the um, Asian communities. Um, sometimes the Italians as well would choose an anglicized name. Um, the, the person themselves um, sometimes had an inability to check what the clerk had written down, um, either because they were um, literate themselves or because the clerk never showed them. <laughs> um, so you can have accent variations that make things very difficult to be understood. So if you have a Welshman saying to a Londoner what their name is, the Londoner is going to write down what they hear and uh, Welsh, some Welsh people have a very thick accent um, and aren't very easy to understand. Um, so that's quite often how um, names can get written down quite wrongly. Um, look out for the formal use, use of names. It's really annoying. Um, this is how a lot of women go missing in history because they are usually Mr. Uh, Mrs. R. Knight or they might be... Um, um, so you don't know whether R is her husband or R is her name, um, probably his. Um, and, uh, you know, so you have to have to look for that scenario. And formal names in legal situations. When it comes to wills, um, always legally, it should be the person's legal name that is mentioned in the will, plus um, any other AKAs otherwise known as. Um, should also be in the will, so aliases. And that can be really useful if you're um, trying to tie up some loose ends, if you find somebody's will, and then you find either them or their, their children or partner or whatever has, a, has their legal name plus all these aliases. That can help you tie up some loose ends from earlier in their lives. Um, <clears throat> so um, again, um, the local library that is local to where you're people live, as well as local to where you live, is, is very helpful. Um, for example, we, we're very happy and proud that we're able to offer um, so much free to um, our customers. We have Ancestry and Find My Past, which is um, Ancestry is good for worldwide research. Find My Past is really good for colonial research. Um, My Heritage is very good for uh, European research um, and uh, also American. The Genealogist is a UK um, specific website um, and a bit of colonial stuff as well. 
And then we have a sort of digitized historical newspapers from around the world as well um, to, to help people with their research. And it's free. Most of these resources you do have to come into the library and use. Um, Find My Past and Ancestry were very good to us during the lockdown for two years, over two years. And we were able to access them from home for a short time for that two year period. But now um, that we're back to normal, whatever normal is these days, um, we have to come back into the library to access them. My Heritage, um, the subscription we have with My Heritage has always been um, enabled us to allow our customers to access that from home. Um, so you just need to access it through the library website and sign in with your library barcode and, and password and, and you can get in um, and uh, away you go. The assorted digitised historical newspapers, we have um, the British Newspaper Archive from the British Library. We have the Gales News newspaper collections um, and a whole variety of um, standalone digitised newspapers as well. Um, uh, so if you if you want further information, you can go to the Learn and Research tab and scroll that down and there's a whole list of stuff to choose from. Uh, you can look under Heritage and there's a whole lot of um, other links that you can look at to help you with your research. Um, there's our there's Kura. So um, Kura is our, our, our newish <laughs> main database now. We're migrating the records over from our old databases into Kura. Um, and we're also digitizing and indexing new resources into Kura as well. So it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Um, there still are, um, some of our old databases are still available, um, of course, where they're not in Kura, they're still available as standalones as well. So you need to have a good rummage around in our um, uh, uh, databases to see what's there. Um, and papers passed. Um, every library in New Zealand um, contributes in some way to Papers Past. Um, we, we funded um, the Auckland Star and New Zealand Herald to be digitised. Um, and we're looking at expanding the coverage of the Auckland Star in a few years, um, a couple of years time. Um, as well as the newspapers, you can see we've got uh, magazines and journals, letters and diaries, parliamentary papers and, and books. So. Um, those of you who are familiar with the Australian, our Australian counterparts, they have Trove. So Papers Past is becoming more like Trove in terms of what content it provides. Um, so uh, just do have a good, good, um, good look out. Um, and when newspapers get digitised, um, it gets announced. Um, and we try and remember to put it on our Facebook page so that people know what the um, latest newspapers that have been released are. Um, so again, just running over the basic principles, interview your relatives, record the women with their maiden names, not with their married names. If you don't know what their maiden name is, leave it blank. Um, if you put their married name in when you're searching online, you will screw up the um, algorithms and you won't get the right answers. Um, the best practice is to record the surnames in caps. That's because if, you, um, if you're printing out um, a, a, a name or you've got a name, if you've got a name like Andrew Henry, which one is the first name and which one's the surname, you know, how do you know? Unless one of them is in caps. And um, if, if everyone sticks to the scenario where it's always the surnames in caps, that makes it quite obvious. Remember that um, genealogy is an international game when you're writing down the date formats. So you write 7th of April, 1876. You wouldn't do 7th seventh, seventh slash 4 slash 1876 because to an American that actually means the 4th of July. It doesn't mean the 7th of April. So um, I've, I've been called out like that before because uh, sharing databases with my Canadian and American cousins um, yeah, really screwed up. Don't forget, again, it's an international game. So um, make sure that your place format is um, obvious. Um, and put where, what country you, it is as well. Um, I mean, I, I had um, um, somebody sent me their database and they said it was London, the place was London. And it's like, well, is that London, England or London, Ontario, Canada? You know, which is it? It could be either with my family. Um, check and double check all the information. Um, try wherever you can to view the original source, the original record. 
Where you can't, um, if they've got a digitized copy of the original record online, then that's great, um, especially if it's really easily legible. Um, or look for official sources um, um, and cite your sources. Where did you get that information from? How many people um, have, have got hold of some information and made note of it and then thought, I'll oh, remember where I got that? And then five years later, you think, where did I get that? And um, the other reason for citing your sources too is not just to help you with your research and re revisiting your research, but also anybody coming after you, they want to know where you got that information from. Um, it's, and, and if you're putting the tree online, like on Ancestry or something, it's very helpful to tell people um, where you got that from so that they don't have to redo their the search. Um, concentrate on one line at a time and retain focus. I really have a trouble with this myself. Um, I, I begin searching for one person and I come across somebody else while I'm searching and I end up going off down a down the wrong track, you know, because I, that person suddenly become more interesting than who I was setting out to research. Um, so retain co co focus, concentrate on one line at a time. When you come up against a brick wall in that line and you think, oh God, put it to one side and then go on to another line and you can return to your brick wall later when more information might be available. So genealogy research, just don't forget that the internet is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, most of the research is done in libraries, archives, courthouses and museums and all the rest of it. Don't forget your gen genealogy and family history societies, your historical societies and other online resources like YouTube and legacy uh, webinars. But give you your tutorials. So they have tutorials on YouTube and, and legacy webinars. But they, on YouTube as well, they often have um, other information where people have been researching certain families. Um, so, and remember, good research is identified by genealogical standards of proof. Any research have type of research has a standard of proof. There is one called um, the genealogy standard of proof. And if you're interested to find out a bit more of that, Google it and it will come up and it will tell you what the standards of proof are. Um, correctly cited resources. And if you're printing a book, please print a book. But if you're printing a book about your research on your family, make sure that you have an index of names and places in the back um, because that makes, makes life so much more easier. And if you're using um, software, you can generate that automatically just by selecting the correct, um, correct things. And uh, just to finish off, my favorite skeleton. So some people might prefer him to stay in the closet. I quite like getting him out and giving him a rattle.